difficult days ahead. So beginning in verse 1, we read, you should know this, Timothy, that in these last days there will be very difficult times. And so he kind of begins with this foreboding, uh, ominous warning here where he calls on Timothy to know this, similar to some language that he's used in, in, in the letter before. It's identifying a warning that's going to come. And it's in the present tense, meaning that you should continue knowing this. This isn't just a one-time thing, but he wants Timothy to be reminded about this subject that he's going to talk about repeatedly and to consider it in an ongoing fashion. He says, in these last days. And so, you may be like me and tempted to think, oh, he must be now referring to something that will be taking place at the end of human history, right before Jesus returns. And you wouldn't be necessarily wrong in thinking that. It's just insufficient. See, in the New Testament, oftentimes this term, the last days, is applied to a much larger scope, much more, uh, you know, more years, more time than just merely those final days before Jesus' return. For example, in Hebrews chapter 1, the author of Hebrews tells us, after God spoke long ago in various portions and in various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, referring to the whole Old Testament, he says, in these last days, he has spoken to us in a son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he created the world. So here the author of Hebrews identifies this period of time following Jesus' first coming, his death on the cross and his resurrection, as the beginning of these last days. See, 2,000 years ago when the author wrote this, he was talking about that period of time as being part of these last days. So if we kind of zoom out and try to consider this in terms of God's timeline in human history, we would begin back here with this point, uh, the cross. 33 AD, Jesus went to the cross he was killed on that cross, he was buried in a tomb, and three days later he rose from the dead. That is what um, the author of Hebrews was referring to when he says that now in these last days through his son, he's initiated this new program. And then you have in the Bible this explanation that that wasn't just the only time Jesus was going to show up, but he's actually going to return at the end of human history to take care of all suffering, all pain, all evil, that it will be permanently done away with, and that he will initiate and set up his kingdom that will last a thousand years, the millennial kingdom. But he, he, this is what's known as Jesus' second coming, when he comes back to the earth, and it's different in almost all ways from his first time coming around. And yet, we have this long span of time where we can look back in history to 33 AD and say, okay, this is when Jesus went to the cross. But then we have this yet future time when he will return. All this period of time in between these two events it goes by several different names in the New Testament. Sometimes it's called the church age because Jesus now is working through his church, his body of, of people around the world. But in this case, based on our passage here, it's referred to as the last days. And so it's not referring to just a couple days, it's a huge span of time, a huge season or chunk or era of time where God is working in specific ways through his people, through the church, the body of Christ, accomplishing many incredible things. But this is, this is a, a limited scope of time, the Bible tells us. And it also tells us that beginning back with the cross, progressing forward in human history up to the end, that things will progressively get worse and worse and worse in their frequency and their intensity. That evil will continue to multiply and it will be more present in frequency and, and greater in its intensity. And so we could see, we could add to our, the timeline here the bad to worse. As a matter of fact, this very chapter of 2 Timothy 3, verse 13 tells us this exact thing. But evil people, charlatans, will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived themselves. 
And if we, if we can look, think, think about chapter 3 here, that first verse identifies this chunk of time that he's talking about going from bad to worse as these last days. And so this frequency and intensity of evil in the world, I think that if we know a little bit about history, we can look at these last several centuries and see that the wars are bigger, they're more deadly, the weapons used are more effectively killing people, that there are plagues and famines and disease, all the rest, yes, that's gone on throughout human history, but the frequency and intensity with which it's happening seems to be increasing. And that's what God says will happen. He says there will be very difficult days ahead, very difficult times. The word here for difficult means savage or violent. It's going to be a violent time, difficult and, 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 and deadly. And the word for time here it kind of it, it supports what we were just looking at on that timeline. It's not the word for chronological time that you would keep on your watch, which is chronos. It's, it's another Greek word, kairos, which means time in terms of a season or an era, a period of time. He says there will be a savage and deadly period of time moving forward in these last days. In 2 Peter, Peter echoes the same thing. He says, above all, understand this. In these last days, blatant scoffers will come being propelled by their own evil urges. And so, Paul isn't the only New Testament author to explain this. Peter does, John does, Jesus talks about this. And so, this is a, a teaching that we see throughout the New Testament. In verse 2, he goes on, he says, For more people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful, proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. And so again, continuing along this grim picture of the way things will, will be in these last days, he begins by saying, for. You could also translate this as because. So he says these days will be, this time will be incredibly difficult because people. Carrying right from verse 1 to verse 2. And so we're given a little hint here of why these days will be so difficult, why this time will be so savage. It's the difficult people that make for the difficult times. There isn't an outside influence that, that is causing things. It's, it's human will. It's human ingenuity. It's human desire, human urge. That is what is contributing to making this world become more and more difficult in these last days. It's the people. That's the source of this. And, and that's why Paul says it this way. Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, God told him, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And so this isn't just a New Testament teaching. We see this in the Old Testament as well. So throughout the Bible, this concept of there being a serious problem, there's something wrong, there's a disease, and it begins right in the human heart. There's something wrong with us inwardly. And so when Paul says here, okay, if it's, if these difficult days are going to come because people are going to be turning away from God. And so we could think about this in terms of uh, a sick body. Imagine a human body that has some sort of disease, some sort of sickness. Let's take cancer. It's a good analogy. Cancer begins in somebody's body. Maybe they don't notice it right away. Maybe it's minor. Maybe it's not really impairing them in any noticeable way, and it slowly spreads and multiplies until the intensity of that uh, cancer brings about more frequent pain. Uh, you become less able to use your body the way that it's meant to be used. Certain elements of the body start breaking down, and that continues to increase in its intensity and frequency up until, if cancer has its way, it kills the body. It's not so different from the way that Paul here is describing the state of our world. There's a disease, there's a sickness here. And it's spreading and gaining in its intensity and frequency. And it will eventually culminate in becoming so bad that it will destroy the body. That it, would, it would destroy the world. 
This is what Jesus himself said about this, referring to this future time at the very end, right before he returns. He says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. So Jesus, with uh, the perfect understanding that he has, in explaining and talking about this future day, is saying it's going to get real bad. He says elsewhere that it'll be worse than it was in the days of Noah. And so this frequency, this intensity going from bad to worse, this is how it's, descri- it's described. And so in this little section here that we're reading in, in 2 Timothy 3, Paul gives 19 different adjectives or 19 different characteristics emphasizing total human depravity, emphasizing this sickness in the human race that's spreading and increasing. And so, he says, as of first importance, people will love only themselves. And I think it's no mistake that he mentions this as the first thing in this list, because the source of many uh, pains, much evil, begins with a self-focus, something the Bible repeatedly challenges us and calls on us to reconsider, to put self in the, in, the, in, the, in the driver's seat, so to speak, to put self on the pedestal, to put self as the number one focus in our lives, ends up actually creating far more problems. It does the exact opposite of what we would think. And Jesus famously said in Matthew 22, he gives the two most important commandments to some people who were asking. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, And he says, the second is equally as important, to love your neighbor as yourself. And I've heard many times from either Bible teachers, people who identify as Christians, uh, and then you see it also throughout the rest of the world, this repeated refrain that, look, even Jesus said you need to love yourself, right? This idea that how can we love others unless we love the self? Look, Jesus says it right here in Matthew 22, 39. The problem, though, is that that is not what Jesus is saying here. That is not what the Bible teaches, and it repeatedly takes down this idea that we need to love and focus on self first to fix ourselves and get our, our own lives in order, so to speak. Repeatedly tells us, no, that is not the way to handle this. See, Jesus knows that as sinful people, as fallen people, we already love self. He's assuming that because he knows that's the case. And so when Jesus uh, is speaking this way, he's in some ways revealing that the problem is that we actually love self too much. We're spending too much of our focus on ourselves, walking around with a big mirror in front of our face or a phone. Whatever the case is, This is the problem, not the solution. And what our world tries to do is offer the disease as a cure. And our world tells us you need to spend some more time thinking about self, reflecting, getting yourself taken care of, putting together your life, introspection, self-care, the list goes on. And what the Bible tells us is that that's the disease. You're trying to cure with, a set and with another sickness. Look at what Jesus says here. The two commands he gives here is to love God and to love your neighbor. He doesn't command to love yourself. And as a matter of fact, some people would raise up a straw man to say, oh, well, so then what, is, what are you saying? Are you saying that now we should hate ourselves? We should beat ourselves up, think lowly of ourselves? Well, hey, that's not for me. No, that's not what we're saying. That's not what Jesus said. That's a false equivalency here. That's, that doesn't line up. That's a straw man argument. The remedy is not self-hatred. The remedy is others focused. The remedy is taking that focus off self and putting it on God and other people. That's the cure. And so that's what Jesus is saying here. Focus on these things, others and God. That is where you'll find true love and true peace. And so, this lovers of self also take on the loving of money. Loving of money. Well, it makes sense if self is first that money would be a part of that. 
We think about money as, as security, as comfort. Money buys us all the things that we think that we need when we're thinking about self. The Proverbs put it this way, the rich think of their wealth as a strong defense. They imagine it to be a high wall of safety. But notice the language that Solomon uses. Think, imagine. He's not saying that that really is a strong defense, that that really is a wall of safety. He's saying this is what people think, and it's wrong. And so Paul says in these last days, this love of money, this materialism, this seeking out comfort and safety and security in whatever it is we think we can purchase, whatever that may be, it could be a degree, it could be a car, it could be a bank account, whatever it is we think money will have the answer for, and we're told when we turn to God that that will not bring us anything more than more trouble. And it's not that God is against money. We read earlier when we were in our study of Timothy, uh, Paul's letters here, that money is contrary to what our world says and pop culture says, oh, money's the root of all evil. Paul tells Timothy that money is a root of many evils. It's not the root of evil. The root of evil begins here in the heart. But money is like a catalyst. It's like, it's like a steroid that you're injecting that's causing you to be, to be even more uh, gung-ho about living for self. Yeah, love of money. This is a solution that God gives to us. Not to love money, but God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that, you, so that because you have enough of everything, in every way, at all times. So what's the solution here? The solution is to be a generous giver. And look at what he says. God wants to make known to you that he will take care of your every need at all times. That's the very thing that we go after money for. The real solution is not in the money, it's in God. He says they will be boastful and proud this word for boastful has its root in ancient Greek referring to uh, like a snake oil salesman, somebody who's a huckster who's just, you know, they're trying to get money from you or get something from you, and, uh, and then, you know, it, it's the idea of being boastful, of, of, of being arrogant and proud, superficial, arrogant. That's what he's saying here. This is another characteristic of our world. The superficiality, it's, it, things are made to look a certain way, but really that's at the heart of it, it's something totally different. And then you have the arrogance where we think that somehow we're better than somebody else, we're more significant. Not true, not true at all. This is what the Bible says. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so this is the solution. It's to seek after humility. It's to set aside a self and to pursue God and others first. He says that, in these last days, there will be those scoffing, scoffing at God, not necessarily at God. The word here is just a single word that's referring to being disrespectful or insulting. Yes, it may include God, but it could also include everything else. We look at our world today, there's quite a bit of disrespectful insults being hurled around, and this has only increased in its intensity in recent years. And so he's describing this, but when we turn to Scripture, this is what we say, the opposite. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you in humility should be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Notice again the exact opposite thing. The world says, yeah, uh, that, that idea, you know, that you think this or that, well, by just scoffing at everything, dissing everything, you know, uh, being super critical and cynical. No, the solution here is to be motivated not by vanity but humility. Looking to others is more important than yourself. He says disobedient to their parents. And so, uh, really, I think what Paul has in, in mind here in these last days is this idea of the breakdown, the destruction, the crumbling of the home and family life. And uh, we've certainly seen this. It's almost like every generation that comes and goes, there's more and more of this. People coming from broken homes, broken families, miserable, terrible, truly uh, suffering in their lives as a result of what's happening in their homes and it affecting them and many more. 
And what we have in this is a crumbling family. It leads to generational problems. It's not just affecting those people in that house because those people, once they leave the house, they don't know this is how they raise their family. They do it the same way, and the problem repeats. It multiplies. It intensifies. And it just keeps spreading generation after generation, getting worse and worse and worse. And when we look around at uh, what family life is like, not just in our country, but in other parts of the world too, this, this total uh, erosion of values that, that promoted the kind of love and uh, security that should be found in a home. And here's the thing. You have the opportunity to turn this around. You are not held dependent on repeating mistakes that happened in your life. Every person has the ability to turn this around. You may not have a family right now, but you may want one one day. You have the opportunity to change the trajectory, to change a whole next generation by deciding to view things the way God does, by refusing to continue to allow the way that the world is trying to destroy and instead allow God to build, to heal, to grow. We each have this opportunity. And so coming to know Christ is that first step, is, is knowing Jesus. He's the one who gives us the ability to overcome this suffering. He says, ungrateful, ungra- ingratitude. This is, uh, seems to be part and parcel when it comes to a self-focus. The idea that you'd be so focused on self and yet so ungrateful, so unthankful in life. And this description of unappreciative without thankfulness, it just goes hand in hand with a life focused on self. Thinking that we, uh, when we focus on self, we can get all the things that we need, provide for all of our necessities. You'd think that the idea, the response would be, I'm incredibly thankful. I'm, I, I live an appreciative, thankful, grateful life. And that's not what we find. We see the exact opposite, wanting more. People... Uh, developing this sense of entitlement, thinking that I need more and I deserve this and I deserve that. And then you have the world breathing down your throat, telling you the same thing. You deserve this. You need more. You need better. You're entitled to deserve what you want is the motto of our culture. Has it made people any happier? Has it made people any more secure? You think about all the advertising dollars that go into this. You deserve the best. One of the the, the main slogans for McDonald's through the 70s and 80s was, you deserve a break today. Go ahead. You deserve it. Whatever it is they're trying to sell you, you deserve it. Go after it. Take it. Or the the repeated meme, we all deserve to be happy. Pursue that at all costs above all else. It doesn't help. This is not the solution to the problem. In Romans 1, Paul says that although they, referring to humanity, knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or give Him thanks. And so this rejection of God to pursue a life of self carries with it ingratitude, unthankfulness. That is one of the keys to our ailment learning to be thankful for what God has given to us and realizing that in reality we deserve nothing. If we are going to ask and plead from God to give us what we deserve, none of us would be happy. But instead what we have is a God who is merciful and a God who is forgiving, who wants us to have a life of gratitude and joy and satisfaction. We read in Luke chapter 6, Jesus he says, love your enemies, do good, to, do good and lend, expecting nothing back. Then your reward will be great because God is kind to ungrateful and evil people. That's me. I'm an ungrateful and evil person. If I'm being honest about what's happened in my life, the things that I think and the things that I've done, I realize I need this kind of God and the kindness that He offers Paul tells the Romans in his second chapter that it's the kindness of God that leads people to turn to him. Yeah, this is the attitude, the the thankful 
life of gratitude, expecting nothing in return, but, but realizing that God's going to give us exactly what we need. He says, they also will consider nothing sacred. This idea of something that's sacred just means a, a, like a reverence for things, a, a respect for something that is good. And he says, so in this case, it would be somebody, you know, these people are being opposed to God, showing no reverence, uh, that there's nothing that's, that's uh, no respect needs to be shown, no sort of the fear of God, the respect and awe of God, that that will slowly be eroded away and lost, that people won't carry this kind of reverence for the Lord. Peter describes it this way. He says these scoffers in, this, in these last days will say, where is his promised return? For ever since our ancestors died, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter says, for they deliberately suppress this fact. And we hear this. We hear this all the time. Oh, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. Oh, yeah, right. People have been saying that for generation after generation. Yeah, we're, everything's the same as it's always been. Suppressing the truth in unrighteousness is the way that Paul describes it to the Romans. Here, Peter deliberately suppressing the facts. Unwilling to show God the, that level of uh, respect that he deserves by at least, just even at the very least, just calling out and saying, God, are you real? Is this legit? And our world says, don't even waste your time with that. Forget about it. He says in verse 3, they will be unloving and unforgiving. Unloving. Yeah, this word here is... Uh, in Greek, it's, it uses one of the terms of the Greek where they have four or five different words for love. Here, it's storgos. When you add an A in front of it, it negates whatever comes after it, just like you would say atheist uh, or um, amoral. It, it means not moral or n belief in, in no God. So, a storgos means literally devoid of love without loving affection. And this, this word, storgos, here is the kind of love that's describing familial love or love that normal kind of love you would have with family and close friends. And so he's saying in this future time, there will be a lack of this happening, a lack of genuine relationships, genuine friendships. Oh, when we look out at our culture today, we know this is true. People are more lonely now, even, they're more, even though they're more connected than they've ever been. Why is that? Something is missing there. The love is missing. Jesus warns that in this future time, he says, because lawlessness will increase so much, the love of many will grow cold. It's this, this, this chilling out of genuine love between people. And... That's, I mean, we see that, that kind of hate all over the place today, the lack of love. He says also unforgiving. Again, we have the negation, a spondos. It means somebody who's irreconcilable or somebody who's refusing, digging their heels in, totally unwilling to negotiate peace with the other party because you hate them refusing to give them the time of day, refusing to give them the consideration, irreconcilable, unwilling to be reconciled. And you think about these two things there, the unloving and the unforgiving. I think these two things go together. Consider the relationship between them. If we can't love people, then we're going to be holding on to plenty of unforgiveness. If we're unwilling to forgive people, then we can't love them. These two things are intimately connected, and so it's no wonder that Paul brings them up here together. In Colossians 3, we're told, bear with each other. The bearing with each other, that, that it carries with it the idea that it's, sometimes it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. That having peace with other people is really difficult sometimes. He says, bear with one another, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And so our basis for forgiving other people, for bearing with one another, for making peace, is that Jesus made peace with us. Is that He forgave us while we were still enemies of Him. 
And so bearing with each other, seeking the peace, looking for ways to reconcile or to, to get back together so that you can uh, iron out differences and continue the friendship. Today in our world, if you disagree with somebody, you just completely isolate yourself from them and you just live in your own echo chamber of choosing with other people who tell you exactly what you want to hear. It's because the world has become unforgiving, irreconcilable. He says that they will slander as well. Diablos is the Greek here. It's one of the names for Satan, the devil. Diablos, it means slander. This, this here is referring to gossip, lying, deceiving, accusing, crap talking other people. You know, this is the talking behind somebody's back just to take them down, just to make yourself seem better. He says this will increase in time as well as intensity. When we do this, though, we're just doing Satan's job for him. When we talk crap about other people, when we spread lies or gossip, deceive, accuse others, slander people, this is Satan's job. This is one of his names. And so it has no place for a follower of Christ. He says, have no self-control. Really, in the Greek, the word self is not there. It's literally no control or without, the negation of control. Out of control in all ways. It's not just self-control, but it's your life is out of control. This may include drugs or alcohol, different addictions. It means ungovernable. It's, it's unable to be governed. Uh, when I was a kid, we, a couple friends and I would get around uh, golf carts or go-karts, and small engines have something on them called a governor. And it just limits the throttle a little bit so that the engine doesn't go get too hot and rev too high and go too fast and become totally uncontrollable. And so they put a governor on it. And so what happens undoubtedly when you do this is total uncontrolled tragedy, right? Because the governor has been taken off. It's become ungovernable. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us, all things are lawful for me, but not everything is beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be controlled by anything. And so the perspective of a follower of Christ is not that I should have the freedom to go and sin. Everyone has that freedom. What we have as followers of Christ is the freedom from sin. The freedom in Christ that allows us to not sin, to not give in to things or be controlled by things to not be a slave to our own desires. He says they will be cruel. Yeah, this, uh, the word here is, means untamable, like a wild animal, a, something, a savage creature, uh, a brutal, animalistic, careless. You know, I think about, um, you know, like I've got some cats, outdoor cats that I feed, and they're feral. And they'll come up every once in a while, and I'll find, you know, the dead chipmunk, the dead mole. I'll, you know what the number one cause of songbird death in America is? House cats. They will kill anything, and they won't even eat it. They don't care about eating it. They're just savage and cruel, untamed animals. You think about a wolf devouring a little Bambi, a baby deer, shredding it. It doesn't care has no empathy or sympathy for that creature. Yeah, that's exactly the way he's like, I used to watch these videos. Maybe you guys have seen these on YouTube. I don't know if they're on there anymore. <laughs> they're called bug fights. Bug fights, and for some reason, they're only in, uh, I think, Japan. They're the only ones who do it. They got it the right idea. But that you'd take, you'd take a couple savage bugs and put them in a little confined area and shake it up and they tear each other apart, poison each other, eat each other, rip each other apart. That's what he's talking about here. <laughs> Cruel. <laughs> Humans becoming animals. And this, if we're honest, this is the result of pure naturalism. This is survival of the fittest. This is Darwinian naturalism to a T, that the strongest survives. The strongest perpetuates their lineage. So in a world without God, you should expect to see something like this. They will also hate what is good. This is just, he's just putting it plainly here. Hating what is good. This is, you know, just that, that idea that 
The thing that should be loved is hated instead. It reminds me of what Isaiah says, beware those who call evil good and good evil, who turn darkness into light and light into darkness. This idea that the thing that should be loved, that is good, that is in God's will, is hated and ridiculed. That's what we see in this world. The things that are evil are being raised up. And, oh, wow, this is so great and so admirable. And if you can't agree with this, then you're evil. That, that exact statement here is being spun around for anyone who's interested in following God. That's exactly what Paul was saying would happen. It reminds me of Romans 2.12. See, for the follower of Christ, we're to have our thinking, our minds transformed by God to not allow our thinking and our minds to be conformed to this world. But our minds should be renewed and transformed so that we can know what the will of God is. And when we don't do that, it's easy to fall into this hating what is good. He says they will betray their friends. This disloyalty, treacherous behavior, the betrayer. This is the same language that's used to describe Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. No loyalty. People, people today, uh, not everyone obviously, but some, it's like friendships, come and go, doesn't matter. Someone doesn't do something you like, toss them out. There's no need to be loyal. When you're living for self first, that is what governs your decisions. No one else. See, loyal love, though, was a defining characteristic of Jesus's. In, Romans, or in, in John 15, 13, he says, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay his life down for his friends. That's literally what Jesus did. And his enemies. Yeah, when we look to the life of Christ as a follower of Jesus, this is what loyalty, that matters. Loving relationships. Reckless, this just means careless, irresponsible, thoughtless, and it carries with it the idea of impulsivity. We definitely see impulsive behavior in our world. If you want something, you go after it. If you, if you desire something, you try and take it. Whatever it is, impulsive behavior, just going after the next thing. Puffed up with pride. We mentioned pride earlier. We know what that is. This is another defining characteristic. Love pleasure rather than God. This is, again, it's another cognate here where you have love, like the kind of brotherly love that we should have, philos, and then the word in English where we get hedonism from, pleasure. So lovers of what, just whatever you want, whatever makes you feel good, that's what you go after. Comfort, in other words, above all else. That is my guiding principle. And so a good question for those of us who want to follow Christ is this. How often does comfort win out in my decision making? If I have several different choices of things I want to do, do I usually choose the one that's most comfortable for me? If so, we might want to reconsider. This is a characteristic of the world. Well, he says, kind of rounding out this list, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could actually make them godly. Stay away from people like that. And so the last characteristic he gives fits in with that very first one, this self-first identity. These, this appearance, the hypocrisy, that I could pretend to do this and look this way and live this way when in reality, I, I'm living something totally different. I don't even believe that. This is the formality, the ritualism, the tradition. Where this is just what I do, just for the sake of appearances. That old phrase, well, keep up for the sake of appearance. When you think about what that really means, this acting a certain way, it has no substance. It's a facade. It's flimsy. Why live like this? Why would you live such a way that you know is fake just for appearances? No, no thanks. Ask yourself this. How long do you think you can keep that up? Why would you want to live like that? If you're going to say you want to, you want to follow after Christ, then take that to its logical conclusion. That means he's real. That means he died for my sin. That means he can really change and affect my life, and he can use me as an instrument to affect others that I can really love. 
Why just try and take some of it for appearance sake and toss out the substance? Well, to round this out, when we think about this whole timeline here that Paul gives us and the list of all these characteristics of these last days, it becomes pretty incredibly overwhelming. We start thinking about all the difficult times, loving self, materialism, boasting, pride, scoffing, disobedient, ungrateful, and the list goes on and on, hypocritical. You may be tempted to just look out at the world and say, I give up. You know, what's the point? This, this sucks. This is awful. And, and, and despair comes in and takes over. But that's not the thing on this timeline that God wants you to focus on. That would be getting down into the minutia and forgetting what the big picture is, which are these two points right here. That Jesus forgives you. If you call out to Him and ask for what He did for you on the cross to apply to you, you will be forever forgiven for all past, all present, and all future sin. And then, to know that God promises that He will come back that there will be an end to all of the suffering and pain and that we will be with Him one day. This should be the governing factor for every other decision that we make. These are the most important things. And if we're focused on this, then we're going to be focused on God and others and not on self. So it would be a great tragedy to forget about these things. And I think that's part of the reason why Paul wants to remind Timothy of it.